the automated podcast. So welcome to the coronavirus special episode of the automated podcast. Um, I'm saying hello from the Barcelona pre-lockdown state, where even though the lockdown goes into effect tomorrow, Monday at 8 a.m., police are already sending people home today. So I hope you're doing fine in your lockdown or pre-lockdown or soon-to-be lockdown state, stocked up on enough supplies, but also didn't go crazy either, like we see in many of the pictures and video clips being shared. Uh, So my family has been sharing stories of people fighting over toilet paper back in Canada. Why this commodity has become so precious is still quite confusing to me and I think to many of you as well. So also, uh, maybe a little bit more on the hopeful side of things, I heard last night an interview with a grocery store supply chain expert who stated that there shouldn't be any real disruptions to stores as they should be able to provide necessary supply for population centers, at least across the Western world. So one to two weeks of food as per usual should be more than enough. But then again, I can also completely understand the fear or panic or even the lack of faith in the system and thus the desire to stock up on things, even toilet paper. So as someone who does a lot of uh, multi-day treks, I luckily had already a lot of extra food from the last trek that I prepared for, but I also went out and got uh, some of my favorite things just in case. But as this podcast is about jobs and technology, I'll keep the topic relevant and won't go on a tangent about infection rates or healthcare problems, etc. But naturally, I think the interest right now is in discussing the coronavirus, so I'll expand on how technology is being used to combat it, how it is impacting technology, and of course, the impact on jobs as always. So next week, hopefully... I'll go back to exploring the other side of the universal basic income and the alternatives that are proposed, as I started last week. So last week I made some mentions of some technologies that are being used to fight the virus, uh, AI being used to speed up the testing results, Uh, this is coming from Alibaba, Uh, robots for disinfecting large areas in different parts of China, and drones for surveillance of people breaking quarantine. So these are quite tangible examples of our technology being used to make a difference. A few less tangible, but no less important, also made headlines this week. So Baidu, most commonly known for its search engine, had developed AI-powered infrared sensors that require no contact. So these sensors can essentially uh, detect temperature changes in people, which can lead the system to know whether somebody potentially has a fever or not, which is, of course, one of the main symptoms of being infected. So these sensors are able to track and scan up to 200 individuals in only one minute without needing uh, the people walking to slow down. So it is currently being used in a railway station in Beijing to identify people who are potentially infected. The main benefit of this, and this is one of the central themes in many of the technologies that I'm talking about today, Um, is that medical personnel are not required to use thermometers on individuals in order to check whether they have had a fever or not. And this uh, not only reduces the risk of medical personnel, but also doesn't create lineups or clusters of people, which, of course, increases the risk of spreading the virus. So additionally, Baidu is using autonomous vehicles to deliver food and supplies to a Beijing hospital and deliver drugs and food to patients in that hospital. So during a time when uh, social distancing has become a new important reality, so these autonomous systems can become instrumental in slowing down the virus. I also mentioned last week that Alibaba was using its AI system to analyze chest scans to detect infection. Baidu's deep learning platform called Paddle Paddle is being used to power uh, competitors to do the same. So much like Alibaba's system, this can detect the disease in under a minute with over 90% accuracy. Uh, So moving on to the next point here, uh, if you're into gaming at all, you might have heard that NVIDIA, the GPU manufacturer, is enabling spare computer power to be used to help research the coronavirus. So a downloadable program links computers into an international network that uses distributed processing power to chew through massive computing tasks, something that uh, gaming-grade GPUs are quite good at. 
So you actually may have heard of uh, distributed computing before through the well-known appearance of SETI at home all the way back in 1999. So this allowed linked computers to volunteer unused capacity to analyze uh, radio signals in the search for extraterrestrial life. So though the 5.2 million participants and over 2 million years of total computation time to date have, of course, yet to find any evidence of intelligent alien life, I think that the sheer power that can be brought to bear on any problem gives hope for solving the coronavirus problem, especially if anywhere near the amount of people that have been using their computers to find extraterrestrial life donate that uh, unused computer power to help um, research the coronavirus. So potentially as harmful as the virus itself, the spread of misinformation about the virus has been dramatically on the rise, even labeled as an infodemic. So Amazon has taken down already over a million products that claim to prevent or treat or cure the coronavirus. So though AI systems have been claimed to be on the way that are able to overcome the majority of the misinformation, currently all Facebook AI systems uh, can do is flag certain points and pass them to human fact checkers. So the main social media tech companies like Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Google slash YouTube have been pushing hard on the misinformation surrounding the coronavirus, which is great to see, but there is still uh, a less rigorous effort when it comes to political or scientific matters. But maybe that's a discussion for another podcast in the future. So we can talk about uh, robots. So a quote-unquote doctor robot has been developed in China to take uh, throat swabs, temperature, use a stethoscope, and navigate around the hospital all by itself. So this is actually a combination of two technologies that we've already talked about on the podcast before. So the robot arm is a collaborative robot arm that has sensors that can detect and slow down when any humans are around, while the base or vehicle part is an AGV that is able to automatically navigate in different areas. So again, this leads to less risk for the medical care workers in the isolation wards, though it is only being tested in hospitals in Beijing now and probably won't be fully operational for some time. This should definitely be further developed if the coronavirus epidemic lasts much longer as many are predicting, but also for the next contagion that comes around. So as we have all been hearing, uh, the hospitals and healthcare systems across infected countries are being completely overtaxed. Supply chains are also being hit hard by limited imports and limited production due to many uh, manufacturing plant closures. So in a hospital in northern Italy, there was one example of 3D printing being used to solve uh, this main issue. So a reanimation device needed a valve replaced, which was impossible for suppliers to bring. And this reanimation device is part of the set of machines that allow people in intensive care to breathe while undergoing the worst part of the coronavirus. Uh, a 3D printer was actually brought into the hospital and the valves were printed on site and the reanimation devices were in working order in just a few hours. So I think that this is a really interesting example of a different technology being used directly at the site of need. And finally, at the Sheba Medical Center in Israel, incoming exposed patients are being quickly quarantined, much like the rest of the world. Naturally, being quarantined for two weeks or longer brings feelings of isolation, loneliness, stress, anxiety, etc. Uh, we are social beings, after all. But at this medical center, uh, VR headsets will be used to both interact with the patients, but also give them the ability to virtually visit different locations across the world, and even has specific programs to help deal with stress and anxiety. This also enables health professionals to distance themselves from their patients. I think it's a really good thing to see that remote treatment is therefore becoming more and more possible because of this. And as of Sunday, uh, these services provided by the uh, XR Health Company are available to all patients in isolation in the United States. So this is a little bit how we are using technology to deal with the virus. Uh, there are many more examples out there, but I thought that these were some of the more interesting and relevant cases uh, to share with all of you. But again, how is the virus impacting technology? 
So as many of you are experiencing or soon will experience, uh, experts are urging social distancing and the elimination of contact as mandatory actions to slow and stop the spread of this virus. However, face-to-face -face interaction is vital for economic continuation, not to mention psychological and emotional stability. But even with uh, tools like Skype, social media, as well as other modern ICT tools, I really think that the gap in the level of interaction is very wide, not to mention uh, connection issues and dropouts, muted microphones, background noise, feedback, etc., etc. So I host and am part of several teleconferences for my work, and it can be downright primordial at times, which really lowers interest and involvement in the work by the stakeholders involved in whatever uh, teleconference is taking place. However, now that we find ourselves in this position of enforced isolation, new options are starting to grow. So one, if not the main alternative, is virtual reality. Though still a ways from being perfect, of course, VR enables a level of immersion and interaction that just isn't available with basic audio or video communication tools. I've talked about VR a number of times on this podcast, especially since purchasing my first headset back at Christmas, but it seems like the situation we are in is really jump-starting its commercial use. For instance, I live in Barcelona, and one of the first impacts to the city was the cancellation of the Mobile World Conference, the world's largest exhibition and conference for the mobile industry. I've personally had two conferences I was planning on attending, as well as client meetings over the coming months, all cancelled or postponed. I'm sure many of you listening are in the same boat as well. But some conferences are taking a little bit of an innovative approach. So the fourth annual Vive Ecosystem Conference, which takes place in Beijing each year, has decided to go entirely virtual. So I'll be, you know, quote unquote, attending it later this week. So if you have a VR headset, let me know and we can meet up in the conference if you want. The event itself will have speakers, panelists and attendees from all across the world with customizable avatars, I might add, interacting and listening to the speakers in this digital space. So though I don't think the level of interaction will, of course, be on par with a normal conference, I'll share my experience next week. But this is just one example. There are several companies out there that are using VR to interact with colleagues while working remotely to get the important feeling of presence and feel like you're making eye contact as well. I'll post a link in the show notes that has some 30 apps, tools, and programs that are already available to use to set these meetings up. Uh, perhaps more relevant though, during our lockdown period, is the ability to meet people in completely surreal environments. And I think that this has an effect on uh, reducing isolation and confinement psychological impacts. So I've heard that you can meet on the space station or the moon, uh, even tropical islands um, at the top of Everest. And even uh, one interesting thing, I've heard of people meeting on the back of a large blue whale as it swims uh, in the ocean. So these might offer more uh, distraction than they're actually worth. But then again, I've read some studies that show that the average person is distracted for 15 minutes during a typical one hour teleconference anyways. So apart from maybe making all of us more aware of the frailty of our healthcare systems, how quickly civilization can be radically changed for the worst, uh, something that I think our older generations clearly experienced, Perhaps this pandemic is allowing us to see that a shift in work that allows lifestyle improvements is actually possible. So a benefit on jobs in particular is that many organizations are now fast forwarding or being forced to have their work practices fit more in line with the capabilities of the 21st century. So a remote work is the obvious example, but flexible work and updated sick leave policies are also at the forefront of this conversation. So along with this, uh, as I've mentioned many times on this podcast, uh, online and data security is being heavily discussed, which might enable remote work to be much more accessible and even uh, allowable in the future. But finally, I wanted to mention that even though uh, the VR industry and many others might be getting a massive boost from the pandemic, 
there are many other industries out there that are finding themselves in the complete opposite situation. As those of us that are in lockdown can see, any business that fits into the conference, restaurant, uh, tourism, hospitality, uh, even education, travel, and many other industries are finding themselves directly out of work with no remote options available. So I have a friend who is a dance teacher and she found herself completely out of work from one day to the next with no alternative source of income. There are countless instances and stories of this being shared across every affected country. Because of this, many are saying that this pandemic might actually hasten a shift in thinking about universal basic income or some alternative practice as people are finding themselves in impossible economic situations. So as I mentioned at the start, Next week, I'll continue, hopefully, with the critiques of uh, universal basic income, but also explore the alternatives that claim to provide the same level of fundamental societal stability that it seems we need more than ever right now. So thanks for listening to this week's episode. If you want to support the podcast, you can leave a like or a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you want to get in touch, feel free to do so over Twitter or LinkedIn by searching for Automated Podcast. On the website, automatedpodcast.org, you can leave a comment on any of the episodes, read the transcripts, and look at the sources I use in all of these episodes. There are also blog articles and additional resources and information on this topic and podcast if you are looking for more. See you next week. The Automated Podcast.